Okay. Yes, sir. I just uh, I want to say belated happy Valentine's to our trustees and everyone uh, in the room today. Uh, this is our public meeting. We're gonna, we're going to turn it over to uh, Lisa Bolt here, Delila Garcia. Uh, this is our required district annual report uh, public hearing, uh, at which time we get to go through some information. As the board knows, we've been through kind of an unorthodox uh, couple of years uh, with the pandemic, uh, but we are still uh, participating on state assessments and we're still looking at data and, and there are some flexibilities uh, with it during that time. And Ms. Polty is going to cover all that. So mm -hmm. I don't know if Delia, if you want to introduce uh, yeah. Lisa or what? Thank you, Dr. Verso. And tonight, um, we do have this cross-divisional. It's a cross-divisional presentation. Now, Ms. Volte was the one that has been creating some nice little graphs for you in order for us to be able to understand this information thoroughly. And so if the, if even in the future, we can always come back and look at this data and even break it down just in order for us to be able to interpret and discuss this data in its entity. But we do have uh, Ms. Lisa Bolte, who is our Executive Director for Assessment and Accountability, which we do appreciate, who has also, uh, in the past years, been able to prepare this report for us. And so tonight, we're going to start our public hearing with our data. Thank you, Lisa. Well, good evening, Mr. Good evening. President, esteemed board members, and community members who are joining us. Today, we're talking about our annual public report hearing. This is the annual hearing we have every year once we receive our final reports from CEA. So there are quite a few pieces that we go through in this annual hearing. The first thing we're going to talk about is our Texas Academic Performance Report, or the TAPER, for 2020-2021. And there is a TAPER report for the district and for each campus in the district. And then we will also talk about our PEAMS Financial Standard Report, our district accreditation status, our campus performance objectives, our report on violent and criminal incidents on campus, our student performance in post-secondary institutions, and our progress toward our board adapt adopted HB3 goals. So lots to cover this evening. So we'll jump right into it by talking about our taper. So the taper is compiled by TEA. It uses two pieces of data. It uses our PEAMS data and our student assessment data. And it is published as a PDF. There's a lot of different information in it. It's a pretty uh, extensive report. It talks about the performance of the students in the district and compares that to the state. It disaggregates that performance by student groups, including ethnicity and social economic status. And then it has extensive information on our school and our district staff, our programs, and our student demographics. So on the cover page, you have the accountability rating. So for 2021, all districts and campuses were not rated, declared state of uh, disaster again for a second year. And then on the cover sheet for the district, we do have the special education determination status. And on the district paper, we also have our armed services vocational aptitude battery, which indicates that yes, we do give that test to all of our high school students that, that are interested in it. And then our distinction designations, of course, with no rating, there were no distinction designations for 2021. Then as you go into the taper, you see our star performance, and it got, breaks it down for all three performance categories, approaches, meets, and masters, and it breaks it down for all grades, all subjects combined, and then all grades by subject. And then the next part is academic growth. Of course, we had no academic growth for 2021 because we did not test in 2020 but it shows our historical growth for 18 and 19. Now, we always like to highlight a little data in our public hearings, so I wanted to highlight our market group, and when we combine all of our grades and all sub subjects, every test we gave together, you can see where we rank compared to our market group. Now we thought this year we'd do something a little different, and we thought we'd look back in time. We've been giving the STAR test, now this will be our 10th year to give the STAR test. So we thought we'd look back, and we thought we'd look at where did we start our very first year STAR, and how did we rank in 2012. So for reading, you can see where we were way back the first year STAR, and then you can see where we are now for 2021, even in the middle of a pandemic. So we've moved up into that, the top four 
for our market share. Wait, wait, wait. What is that 67 in 2012? What does that 67 mean? That's the so that was the percent that reached an uh, approaches level on the test back in 2012. And then in 2021, we're at 58. Is yeah. that the same number? So, but it, we're looking at, remember, we came off a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So even with, in the middle of a pandemic, how do we compare to our market group? We moved from the bottom of our market group to the top of our market group, even in the middle of a pandemic. So if we look at 2012 for math, everybody, everybody we can no, see where we were in 2012 for our market group, and then where we are now, even in the middle of a pandemic, where we are compared to our market group for all of our math tests. And then writing. This is the last year, 2021 is the last year we will give a separate writing test. So this is going to be turning into a combined reading writing test in 2023. So 2021 is the last time we give it. So in, back in 2012, we were in the bottom four for our market group. And now we're in, in 2021, we're in the top four in our market group. Science, science in 2012, in the middle of the pack. And science in 2021, so we know where our work is. And then 2012 for social studies, first year we gave it. Where were, where, were we, where were we with our market group? And then in the middle of the pandemic, where were we compared to our market group? We thought that data, data would be of interest to the board to be able to look at that comparison. Mm -hmm. So going back to the taper, the next thing that is included in our taper is a breakdown of our bilingual, bilingual education English as a second language program. So you have our star performance for the students that are participating in that program disaggregated. And then our star per participation rate for 2021 and 2019. It's a very long report. The next page talks about attendance, graduation, and dropout rates. And that look that is delayed data. So we're looking at 2020 and 2019 because that is the most recent years that that data is available to TA. So we look at the drop, attendance rate and dropout rate and our four, five, and six year extended gradu and longitudinal graduation rates and our graduation plans and the graduation profile for our 2020 graduates. The next part of the taper talks about college and career and military readiness. So it breaks out our CCMR graduates. It breaks it out to those that were college ready and those that were military or career ready. And then it breaks it out further for our college ready graduates by their TSIA results, their CT coherent for sequence, those that completed a college prep course, and then AP, IB, SAT, and ACT results. Then we have our other post-secondary indicators, which is advanced dual credit course completion, graduates enrolled in higher education, and graduates enrolled in higher education that did not need to be enrolled in a developmental education course. And this is where our market share looks with the class of 2020 in the middle of a pandemic, where we were with the, the percent of students that were able to complete college, career, or military readiness. The next part of the taper talks about our student information. It gives our student enrollment broken down by different categories, and then our staff information broken out by those same kind of categories, and then our program information where it talks about our student enrollment by program and how many teachers we have for each program. So all of that is included in the taper. So the next part, portion of the public hearing, we're going to talk about another report, and this is our PEAMS Financial Standards Report, so I'm going to invite Mr. Crisp to talk about that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so if you look in your packet, you can kind of see that we actually, through three submissions through the PEAMS Department, submit our actual financial data 
uh, as we work through the budget, most of it's projections, but as the year goes on, we get actual revenue, we get actual uh, expenditures. And so we report those, and those are those that data is used to grade us. And when we talk about our first rating and looking at our actual revenue versus expenditures, that's we get a grade on upon that. Uh, also in there, it compares our, our data financially to the state, and it looks at the percentages and the amounts we're spending per pupil to see where we compare to the state. Uh, and then it'll further break down per campus. And so in your packet, you have just the district, but if you go actually into the report in, on TEA, it will break it down per campus, per high school, per middle school, compare our own schools upon each other. Uh, so it's just further data uh, to show where we're at and how we compare to each other and then how we compare it to the state. It also lists our tax rates, our, our fund balances, because we have to report that all to the state. And so, uh, and it's basically what they use. And when we come in November and we talk about our first rating, uh, a lot of that data is what they, they use to, to grade us. And, and then the different questions that they ask, they look at this data to determine whether we got a superior rating or we're below average or if we fail. Uh, and so it's a very important data that we have clean data that we're sending them. And also that we can be proud of that you can look at the data and see where we compare to the state and see where possibly we need to make adjustments to funding uh, and what we're looking at as far as programs because they also break it down by program, program intent code, what we're spending on special ed, GT, dyslexia, all the different programs that the state requires us to spend funding on. And so uh, if you look there, you can kind of see the comparison. And if you want to go deeper, you can go onto the website and, and actually break it down per campus uh, in our district. Thank you, Mr. Chris. So the next portion of this public hearing is we're going to talk about our district accreditation status. Every year, TEA assigns one of four accreditation statuses to each district in the state, either accredited, accredited, warned, accredited probation, or not accredited, revoked. And this rating relies very heavily on our assessment results. And because now we have two years with no assessment, the, the state has assigned all districts uh, no accreditation status for 2021 because of the state of emergency. So the next thing we're going to talk about is campus performance objectives. Every campus has developed and is implementing a campus improvement plan. And each campus improvement plan includes performance objectives, which are approved by the board. And those are based on data analysis and needs assessment, including the data that you find in the taper. And our updated Campus improvement plans are on our, pu our public website. You can look at those and see our campus progress toward meeting their performance objectives. So now we're going to talk about our report on violent or criminal incidents. So I'm going to invite Mr. Adrian Ramirez to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. As part of the annual report, districts are required to publish and report on ins uh, violent and criminal incidents that occur or take place at uh, each campus. Uh, and I'm happy to report that during the 2021, during the 2020-21 school year, Southwest ISD reported no violent or criminal incidents. So, are there any questions? Thank you. And in your packet, you have the breakdown with all the codes that are used for that uh, designation. So you can see what which ones the state is looking at. So now we're going to talk about our student performance in post-secondary institutions. So as part of the annual report, we're required to publish a report on how our students performed the very first year after graduation in institutions in any higher education facilities, so colleges and universities in the state of Texas. So this is lagging data again. So our most current report is for our 20, class of 2019 graduates. And the report breaks out their grade point average and the amount of college uh, semester hours that they completed. So here are our two high schools. <clears throat> So we have how many students at each high school went on to a Texas four-year public university or a Texas two-year public university or a Texas independent college or university. Then we have our number of students that are not trackable. They're not trackable because they have a state ID that does not match to the IDs that are used by the 
higher ed system. And then we have not found. Among those not found students are going to be included any students that went out of state. So if your child goes to New York, to Harvard, to Stanford, they are not going to be reported in this because PA can only track the students that stay in the state of Texas. So now our last se section is a new section for our public report, and that is our progress of the district and each campus toward meeting board appointed House Bill Bell 3 goals. This is a new section because House Bill 3 is not that old, and we just created those goals in the past year. So in the board packet, you'll see um, our goals and our progress thus far toward meeting those goals. All goals for third grade are at the meets level on STAR for reading and for math. And then at the <coughs> high school level, we have our CCMR uh, amount of performance that is being tracked. <coughs> so lastly, there is a glossary for the taper. It is available in both English and Spanish, so it goes into definitions and explains some of the terminology and the data sources that are used to compile the taper report. The district taper and the campus tapers will be posted on our public website within two weeks of this hearing. And of course, anyone who would like a paper copy, is, we would be happy to print one for them. And if you have any questions, please contact myself and I'd be happy to answer anything. So if we have any questions at this moment, we do have a few more uh, minutes left. So if we have any questions from either the board or the public, since it, if this is a public hearing. Board members, any questions? I got a couple. Um, going with the comparison groups of our taper report, the only thing that I kind of worry about is that we stand between, like say, um, going with um, the reading. It goes from 50 to 67. The thing that I'm worried about is if, I know it's during the pandemic, um, we, went, uh, we went down mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now we got to go back up. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we maintained our certain numbers in certain areas. And then it just, uh, that's what I'm worried about is are we, are we trying to push up to the next level, which is probably a level above after the pandemic. Yeah. And I, I did, right, and I don't want to provide, I want to provide a little bit of detail in the work that when we're looking at 2012, it was a whole different accountability system in 2012. And at the same time, the assessment, the rigor of the assessment in 2012 is nothing like okay. the rigor of 2021, 2019, 2020. The rigor where they got some skills that the students were supposed to master in eighth grade, they moved some of that down to sixth grade, down to seventh grade. So even in math throughout the years, um, I would say that, came, that change came about like maybe 2015, 2016, where we had to start moving some of those algebra concepts down to the middle schools, some of those seventh grade concepts even down to the elementaries. So although we're looking at 2012 data, we still had to do some re readjustments, just like the rest of the districts. We had to do some readjustments in the way we were um, just the delivery of those concepts, we had to train the teachers, and then so the students had to be given much more rigorous content. At the same time, our accountability system also changed. So back then in 2012, the students that were at all or meets, the percentage is very different from the percentage that we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily, uh, what we're looking at here is more like where do we stand in district-wide, but if we get down to the detail of the assessment was different, the content in the assessment was different, and then also the accountability of the all of the people that are meets, masters, and approaches. We were not even listening to that back in 2012. It was not even part of the accountability system. So now that is what we are looking at. It's not so much our students meeting, but we're looking at is are they college and career ready, which is a lot more rigorous. So there's a lot of things that changed in, in the process of this. But what we're looking at here is like, are we still pushing our district where we are making the same adjustments and, you know, necessary in order for us to stay where those changes are occurring? Mm -hmm. And, and so these numbers, mm -hmm. like, like you're saying, across the whole board, everybody's numbers have been down. But it seems even though our numbers have come down, we've done a better job than other districts in mm -hmm. trying to maintain that number. It's, it's right. not as high as we'd like, but we've done a better job than other districts mm -hmm. where they dropped tremendously, mm -hmm. but across the board, everybody's numbers are down. That's a good way to look at us 
just like you're saying, Mr. Correo, that in 2012 it was comparing apples to apples to the truck. Yeah. Then in 2021 it's comparing apples to apples. So it's not comparing apples to apples between 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of changes that happened with the assessment itself. Mm -hmm. We got a cut score that uh, the state takes all the data and they look at the data and they reassess their cut scores and they may raise them up higher. The idea is to always aspire to achieve up to a certain level. I want to caution everyone, we do put up ranked data, but that's always been what we look at in our district. But it's not so much looking where we're ranked, but rather looking at the mobility and where we're from. I think that is real uh, mm -hmm. important to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the learning, uh, teaching and learning that's happening in the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, we try to get metrics to show uh, that there is learning happening, mm -hmm. uh, which means there's effective teaching happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to show. And do we have. I know there was a couple of schools on probation. Is there, do we have anything that um, will affect, since we're already on our second, uh, I guess our second round without getting a rating, do we have any idea of where the, those schools will probably stand as soon as we come out of this pandemic and knowing that, are we going to be okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So their accountability ratings were frozen in time. Yeah. Um, so they, the two years of no ratings will not count for against them. So they... When we get our ratings in 2022, the state has decided that they're going to give campuses and districts that achieve a, a letter grade of A, B, or C, their A, B, or C, so that they can acknowledge the good work that they are doing. But those campuses or districts that are <coughs> below that C level, based on the algorithm, they will receive, again, a not rated label, because they don't okay. want to penalize them yeah. because we're coming out of the pandemic. I think that's what, one of the things I was worried about. However, if you look at A, B, or C, it's going to be pretty obvious. Yes, mm -hmm. it will be obvious where you landed. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for the board? If not at this time, any public comments or questions? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. I'd like to call this regular meeting to order on the 15th of February. Dr. Versta, we have an uh, invocation and pledge of allegiance. Yes, sir. And again, welcome to this regular Fe February 15th meeting of 2022. I would like to ask Mr. Roger Campos to please lead us in our invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand by your heads. <clears throat> Lord, we are meeting today regarding matters of Southwest ISD. Be with us in our discussions as, we are, as it is our privilege and our responsibility to support, foster, and advance the students of Southwest. Give us insight and courage to do your will with compassion and reverence as stewards and companions for the benefit of the entire district, community, and beyond. Help us to know and believe in the gifts you have given our leadership and trustees, both individually and collectively. Inspire us to solve the challenges we may face and take, to take joy in our shared triumphs. In faith and hope, we trust in your presence and guidance today. In your name we pray, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor, Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Campo. Thank you, Roger. Okay, we have some recognitions. Yes, sir. We do have some recognitions this evening. We have our, our students of the month who are coming in. And then I know uh, we have another special recognition of a, a guest uh, external to Southwest ISD, but it would be better an internal to Southwest ISD as well. And I know we have a soccer player who has a soccer game coming up. We're going to get right into it. <laughs> you can make her name. All right, good evening, everyone. First up is Sara E. Fernandez Leon from Southwest High School. Sarai is currently a senior at Southwest High School. She serves as the captain of the girls' soccer team. She's vice president of her senior class, a member of the National Honor Society and Spanish Honor Society, and currently ranks at the top of her graduating class. Sarai has taken multiple dual credit courses and currently participates in the Alamo Academy Health Science Program taking classes at San Antonio College. Sarai currently holds the record for most goals scored in a girls' soccer game, hitting 100 goals on January 20th, 
and still counting. All of her hard work is paying off as she will have the opportunity to play soccer at the next level and continue her education at St. Mary's University. Congratulations. <laughs> Next up is June Ibarra from Medio Creek Elementary School. June is currently a fourth grader at Medio Creek and is a shining example of leadership and excellence on and off campus. June participates in the ambassador program where her leadership is cultivated, and she is often seen practicing this leadership in her visits with younger children, working with after school bus duty, and various leadership opportunities that she takes on in stride. Her leadership is also demonstrated in her academic successes. She is top in her class and mentors other students in class as well. June would like to work with younger children when she grows up, but isn't sure just yet if it will be in teaching or other services. June is a shining example of Gator greatness. Congratulations. <laughs> Next is Jordan Vinaha. Jordan is described as an outstanding student at McAuliffe Middle School. He is currently an eighth grade student has maintained straight A's all year long and is in honors classes. He's also a proud member of the Mighty Rocket Band and the choir program. Jordan has a heart of gold. He helps all teachers and the custodians clean up after classes and lunch. He greets all students and staff with the warmest smile. Jordan possesses superb musical talent and unfailing kindness and maturity beyond his years. His teachers describe him as a joy to teach and learn from. He is highly respectful and is very kind, and he truly, truly models the rocket way. Congratulations. recognize a friend of Southwest. Would a Miss Kat Slagle please stand up? Kat <laughs> Slagle is the Vice President of Community Labs. Community Labs SA is a nonprofit organization that creates COVID-19 safety zones throughout San Antonio. Community Labs provides timely PCR COVID-19 testing at multiple sites across the community. In addition, Community Labs provides weekly testing at more than 300 plus school campuses and businesses, with Southwest ISD being one of those districts. Ms. Slagle was instrumental in helping set up the partnership with Community Labs back in the fall of 2020. Since its inception with a few pilot schools in November of 2020, it has grown to include all Southwest ISD campuses. Over the last 16 months, Community Labs has conducted over 120,000 COVID-19 tests for students and staff. The partnership has helped Southwest ISD navigate the sometimes challenging waters of this pandemic. Therefore, we would like to award Ms. Slagle the Southwest ISD Friend of the Community Award. A leaf will be placed on our tree here in the boardroom to honor her contribution to our community. 
In addition, she is receiving a replica of the award to keep. We are forever indebted to Ms. Slagle and Community Labs and are incredibly thankful for everything you and your organization have done for Southwest ISD. Thank you. I, I just want to say when uh, the pandemic hit, it was very important to get testing opportunities to our students. And if it weren't for the, the energy of Staff Slagle uh, to really push the needle and make it happen, and happen on everyone of our campus to really be uh, we would not have been able to offer the most safest environment for, for our, our students and for our families. And so you have been a, a, a North Pole uh, mm -hmm. in this whole kind of unorthodox time. And we just want you to know how much we appreciate everything that you've done and all your late hours and moving things around, stealing some testing spikes. <laughs> 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 Whatever you did, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, at this time, those of you that have been recognized, once again, congratulations and thank you for what you all do. And at this time, uh, you're more than welcome to be excused. I mean, this is the, believe me, this is the most uh, exciting part of the meeting, okay? <laughs> you're also welcome to stay for the next couple hours. But at this time, if you'd like to leave, please do. Pat, I didn't ask for parents they did I do have a few things for you three board members, so I will just leave them with Robert whenever you guys are okay. Thank you. Thank you. Or Roger. <laughs> mm hmm He's so cute. It's a little man. <laughs> okay, we'll continue with the meeting at this time. Uh, public comments? Mr. Rodriguez, Mona, do we have anybody? Mr. Godoris is coming. Okay. Mr. Godoris, you're on. All right. Good evening, board members. Good evening, everyone Good evening. here tonight. We do have one person signed up to speak. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just go ahead and read our our public hearing rules of engagement whenever we're speaking. So I will start with that tonight. When addressing the audience during the public forum, speaker's commentary must adhere to the following. Everyone must model courtesy and respect. Speakers shall not employ profane or threatening language, nor shall they engage in any personal attacks. The public has the right to make critical and harsh remarks, however, the expectation is that the message delivered by the speaker is done so in a constructive manner with a collaborative purpose. Speakers are expected to respect both the decorum of the public meeting and the authority of the board. The Board of Trustees requests that derogatory or inflammatory statements and personal attacks on individuals be avoided. Caution should be exercised in publicly attacking specific individuals. In accordance with board policy BED local, the board shall not deliberate or respond to any subject that is not included on the agenda posted with the notice of the meeting. Speakers who have signed up to speak on a specific agenda item must focus their own comments on the posted agenda item. We have one person who signed up to speak for general public comments this evening. Do we have Ms. Alejandra Lopez here? Ms. Lopez, if you would like to come up, you will have three minutes. Thank you very much. Good evening, President Vasquez, Superintendent Verstiff, and members of the board. My name is Alejandra Lopez. My roots run deep in the Southwest community. Our family goes back five generations. My paternal grandfather attended Southwest High School, as did my parents and countless tias, tios, and cousins. I graduated salutatorian from Southwest High School in 2004 and earned my bachelor's degree from Stanford University in 2008. In 2015, I returned home to San Antonio to serve my city as a public school educator and have since earned my master's degree in educational leadership from UTSA. I have always been proud to showcase my Southwest roots, to speak of the strong sense of community that exists here. However, that changed last month as I witnessed five members of this board make the choice to actively suppress the vote of members of the Southwest community. 
As a second grade teacher, one of my teaks is to, quote, identify ways that public officials are selected, including election to office. In my class, we would discuss elections and voting. One of the texts we would read is this one here, Granddaddy's Turn by Eric Stein and Michael S. Bandy, a powerful book that depicts the kind of voter suppression that took place in the early and mid-1900s, the kind of voter suppression that led to the civil rights movement. It is important for those of us that grow up in working class communities of color to understand the historical legacy of voter suppression. What is voter suppression? Since it's clear that at least five members of this board either don't understand or don't care that they are employing voter suppression tactics, voter suppression is any strategy meant to reduce voting. In the book Granddaddy's Turn, the voter suppression tactic employed is a literacy test used by racist state and local governments meant to deny the right to vote to the African American community. The voter suppression tactic on full display here in the Southwest community is a decision made by the board just last month that will mean that thousands of Southwest ISD voters will have to go to a completely separate polling location to vote for Southwest ISD school board trustees, thus creating a barrier to these individuals exercising their right to vote. The numbers are clear. In the May 2021 election, 1,321 City of San Antonio voters voted in the municipal elections. However, only 284 of those same voters voted in the Southwest ISD school board elections. Why? Because this board purposely chose to hold their elections with the city of Lytle as opposed to Bear County, meaning that voters who live in the city of San Antonio and within Southwest ISD boundaries have to go to two polling locations, effectively suppressing the vote of 1,037 members of the Southwest community. Southwest is the only district who does not hold its school board election with Bear County. I have heard the rhetoric of tradition employed as a justification for this decision. My response is that if what you mean by tradition is that it has been a tradition to suppress the vote of thousands of Southwest ISD community members, then I say it's time to make new traditions. Traditions rooted in diversity and inclusion. Traditions that we can be proud to pass on to the younger generation of dragons and titans. Thank you. Thank you. And that was the only one in the middle? Thank you. Okay. We'll now move on to the consent agenda item five. Board members, you've all had that before you. Any questions? Item C, what is the amendment for? Item C, board amendment, as in your packet. <laughs> it was in your packet. Did you not have a chance to read it? Yeah, I know they put a Some money out of 11 to 36. Uh, a lot of that's going to cover. We have some campuses that want to do blue ribbon next year, uh, and so they're, they're allocating funds for that. Some things happen in field trips. Uh, we have some funds coming out of athletics and moving around for some of the uh, uh, late spring sports that they need to cover, like travel, and they also need to cover uh, referees. Uh, uh, so that's what they're moving the money around. And then the last piece is the uh, custodial supplies. We've asked the campuses to make sure that they can finish the year and have enough supplies within their budgets uh, as we met in meeting with the principals over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> so those are the big ones. There's not a whole lot of money moving, uh, but those are the, the top. Hearing that, would you like to pull the item? No? OK. Any other questions? This slide is moving between objects on it and the I normally put a background on there, and I did it this time. I apologize. No problem. Okay, I'll entertain the motion. I move. Mm, second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Items information. Construction update? Yes, sir. Tonight we have Mr. Barajas is going to give you a, a quick update. We have a couple of, of our uh, architects and construction uh, contractors here tonight. Kind of giving you an idea of some of the ongoing projects we have for tomorrow. Yes, sir. Uh, here we're going to present the uh, three last projects of our 2018 bond. We'll start with the Aquatic Center. Uh, to present the project, we have uh, Mr. Sean Bacon with Marvin Moff. And Matt, I apologize for your name. Right. Matthew Price. Yes, he's uh, a new addition to Joris, uh, and he's been an assistant uh, project manager for the project. All right. Well, good evening. I, I know it's been a little bit before the last time we've been here, but uh, I will tell you uh, a lot has been done. And like I said before, a lot of it is not really seen as much when you see from an aerial view or something because we're really working a lot on the interior. So let's get started. Uh, currently, uh, budget still where it is. Uh, we're still working towards the contingencies. Uh, we still have uh, good money in contingencies. We're basically 67% with the latest pay up as a, at, as at the end of uh, <clears throat> excuse me January. So we are moving. And here, Matt will talk about uh, where we are in construction, what's coming and going for the next couple of weeks. So right now, uh, as you can see, the structural steel is all framed out. We're working on the roof aspect, so we're drying in the entire building. So if you drove by today, you see we're putting insulation and in starting all those roof aspects to it. And then as we move forward into the building, a lot of our walls are framed and we're working on finishes, but the main goal right now is uh, finishing up the roof, and then at the same time, we are painting the interior of the pool area, which is our big aspect. And so as you can see, uh, <clears throat> doesn't look like a lot's been done when you look at it from an aerial, but I promise you, there is a lot going on and a lot getting done. Uh, as Matt said, uh, we're working on drawing in the facility. Uh, we'll tell you that's been a little tough with, uh, with COVID. There was a little stint where that kind of hit some of the workforces. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the typical materials shortages that we had previously talked about, but the, uh, Joris has been working diligently to confirm with the subs that uh, we don't have any other issues. So that is uh, right now, we really don't have any to report, but I'll continue around. These are some aerial flybys. In the interior, you can see some of the framing is, is, is already started on the interior walls. The Martha pool, the, the, most, the biggest component of that, you can see those walls are going in. And then at the top of the image is again more of the Martha. And then the bottom are kind of some of the electrical showing that the, all the utilities are in place. Uh, they haven't been uh, allowed to, to, uh, 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 to be uh, uh, transferred over yet, but uh, we've got the, uh, the gas and the uh, uh, power transformer in place. And so that's basically where we are. Uh, it's moving forward. It's, it's still very successful uh, with, with timing. We're, we're trying to improve. As you know, we're, we've had to shift the, the, the finish line on that. Uh, but we're trying to hold tight to that. So no, no hiccups at this point. And we're meeting uh, the team. We're going to meet next week to kind of discuss some of the things that are ongoing. Uh, and it's really dealing with uh, the COVID issues that we dealt with, especially with materials, uh, and like I we talked about previously, is trying to figure out a date that is an actual substantial completion date, uh, and we'll be sharing that with the subcommittee uh, based on what we did uh, with our team working with all the, the, the teams involved, uh, and then we'll bring that to the board next month to kind of get a better idea uh, on where we are as far as a substantial completion and where we're at on this project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is our transportation department, and we have uh, Suresh with RVK to give us a quick update on transportation. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Sure. We've moved along real well on this project. The front uh, admin area is uh, we punched last Thursday, 
So you could see all of the training room and the break room. You, you know, it's almost complete. All of those ceiling tiles were removed just to do a, a above ceiling inspection. But um, it, it, they're they're done. They're doing the final cleaning and they've, they've, they have waxed the floors and so it's looking good. The front portion is almost done. Um, all of the equipment is set. The fences. Uh, for the mechanical enclosure is all in place. The equipment is working. It's complete. The, 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 system, the whole uh, campus has been switched to this new equipment. Have no hiccups. The fueling station is completed. The paint, the lights. You can also see a little bit of that canopy of the bus wash. So the canopy is installed, the structure is in place. The walls received a coat of paint. You can also see the wash equipment, the exterior wash equipment is, is in place. It's all ready to hook up. So they're working on the oil and sand separator. Once that's done, we could test the equipment. This is the new bus horn. And all of the equipment is installed, ready to go. This is the, uh, the, uh, the open bay that's enclosed. Uh, fortunately, the, this is the existing panel and this is the new panel. You can't tell the difference. It matched real good. And also, you can see here, uh, the, 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 the overhead doors still need to be installed. But this is the maintenance base. The lighting is completed. So they're going to start working on the back end of the admin building. They're going to move the, uh, the staff to the renovated portion, and then the renovation on, on the other part will start. We anticipate, I mean, we're all on schedule, so we should be done with everything uh, March 18th. So the, the switch is going to happen on Monday, uh, being that it's a staff development day. Um, all of the staff on the on the back portion of the building will move once that floor is waxed, which is happening as we speak. Uh, other than that, the back portion will be the area that's left to be renovated. The biggest scope of it has now been completed. Everything else will be uh, acceptable and finishes on the back. So, any questions? No. Mm -hmm. any, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. And last, uh, is the sorry the tracks and I'm just going to move to second to the last page really that's Scobie Middle School um, on that one the only item remaining is the track surfacing as of right now we're 50 percent complete to be followed by the final top coat and then followed by the striping so we're looking at the end of this month to be 100 uh, percent complete on that track. But uh, the other three other schools have now been released to the district. And that is it for the construction updates. Any questions? So say our projects are looking really good. Thank you. Yeah. We try to say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Monthly tax report. Yes, sir. We actually had a really good end of December and January, so we're back on par. So we're right there where we were last year. Um, so we had some great selections in this month, which is a little nervous tax for that month, but we had a ground. Thank you. Monthly financial report, investment report. We've had those before you. Any questions? Report on gifts and requests, enrollment report, review purchases over 50,000. Any questions there? Calendar events. Okay, I believe we do have something on the, the T class. Is that correct? So we have uh, Will Victor coming in to yes, sir. Um, give you some information. 
and this was already approved um, by the board um, to go into this grant. So we're going to be using more information um, so that we can hear from um, care professionals things that are coming in a way that you guys understand uh, exactly what the contestable represents. Good evening, uh, President Vasquez, board members. Okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're going to call this the, this part of the grant our Grow Our Own grant. And basically what we have is we have some funds over the next two academic years starting in the fall of 22 to uh, reimburse some paraprofessionals who are trying to complete their degrees and get certified as teachers. So if uh, they meet their qualifications, we have about five uh, separate, uh, I'll call them scholarships that we can provide them over two years. Uh, and in return for them agreeing to uh, become a part of this program, uh, they will guarantee they will stay with the district for three years after they complete their degrees and certifications as teachers for us. So we, we look at this as a good opportunity to stay competitive in our market and uh, uh, find teachers to fill some much needed positions and why not grow our own in our system. So uh, we have a, uh, some requirements though that TEA has put on us. Uh, the, the person must have a bachelor's degree or have 75 hours toward the degree. They must be an instructional paraprofessional within the district. They must be able to complete that bachelor's degree and or the certification within the two years and be ready to teach the fall of 2024. And then of course they would commit to the district uh, for three years after completion of that degree and certification. So right now we're collecting the applications. We have a process by which they'll be reviewed and hopefully we'll, we've been approved by TEA for five of these, these grants. Okay. Thank you. What if the, like, you have a paraprofessional that's like halfway through their stuff already, they still qualify or basically that's not yeah. yet? No, we're looking for someone who's already gotten 75 hours, at least 75 hours oh. completed. Oh, I meant the, uh, the program, the, the certification program. The certification program, yeah. yeah. If, if they're in, the, in that, that they can be considered. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Growth and planning. Thank yes. you. Yes, sir. I just wanted to kind of bring back to the board. You know, we haven't really had a growth and planning committee meeting in a pre-pandemic. I said last time we had it in the last bond. Uh, and as we start to prepare for the future, we probably need to get the committee back together. And so I just wanted to put together some guidelines and, and so uh, the board is familiar with why we have the committee uh, and at the same time who's part of that committee. And so just to kind of look at the purpose, and I'm going to read these to you, and I, I know they're on here, uh, is really looking at the, uh, the, the committee that's going to be a recommending body that goes through back to the facility subcommittee to the school board. Uh, and so we're looking at the following areas, is new, any new and existing facilities that need either built or renovated, uh, looking at technology infrastructure, looking at the educational environment, uh, looking at district growth, at this meeting we'd like to bring the demographic study to this group, uh, look at short-term plans sometimes to address some of our needs, um, and then also looking at the long-range plans, which is what we get into the bond. Uh, the structure, the structure's been set up where we've invited the principals of every campus, and so the principals are a, a voting member of the committee. Uh, we ask the, the, the campuses to provide us their PTA president or an officer uh, to be on that committee. If the campus is, is struggling with the PTA, which we don't want any of them to do that, but sometimes it happens, we ask them to bring somebody that's really been a part of their campus culture and, and been on campus and supported their campus. So we want to make sure that we have representation across the district. Uh, and then we have uh, six the board members to give us a, a person of interest that you would like for us to have on the committee. Uh, and then we have the superintendent that also does the uh, appointment of one person. And then uh, those the board presidents, a member, and then two board members that the board president appoints. Uh, and the idea is to look at this committee and then obviously as the year starts over in September to, to look at the, the organization again. Things change, principals leave, so they become, and the new ones become a member, PTA presidents may leave, so every year we visit and make sure we have the right personnel. The idea uh, is not really to have a majority vote, but more of the committee to have a consensus of what we want to do, and so at our previous bond we had our projects and then we kind of voted and we moved them around, uh, and so that they can make, make a recommendation. Uh, we take that back to the facility subcommittee, uh, we, we can look at it in 
in our committee, that committee, and then at the end of the day, the, we'll have a recommendation to the school board on how to move forward. Uh, resource personnel put on there, but most of these people on here, like myself, is a facilitator of the committee. Sometimes when we're talking about child nutrition and things that are needed in the child nutrition department, we'll have Mr. Gatlin there. If obviously it's construction, we'll have a construction team there to help facilitate the meeting. Uh, and really, I just wanted to share that with you. Also, I had a flow chart kind of like on how it works in, in, a, in a, the best way I could do it. Uh, because really, a lot of the ideas come from, we start with the district personnel and we looked at our needs. We take that to the, our, our facility subcommittee that we have here internally. We start bringing up ideas, we start creating ideas, we start creating a plan. And then we share that with the growth and planning. And usually, we have more than we can do. And so, when we take the growth and planning committee and we work those things out, we get to a number, get to a, a list, and we bring that back to the facilities and kind of vet it again. We have another growth and planning committee, and at the end of the day, that's what we bring forth to the board. And so, it kind of gives you an idea. And, that, and when it's all said and done, uh, we go back to the facility subcommittee because that, that committee is really, once we have a bond passed, that committee is the oversight committee. It's really looking at, okay, are we doing what exactly you're seeing today? Uh, and then we bring the rest of that to the board. So I just wanted to share that with you. I don't know if there's any questions on this. So uh, how many um, people are on that committee, sir? 46. 46. We have 46 members. Uh, we'd like to have 46 uh, committee members. It's not open committee. It's, a, it's, it's 46 members. Uh, and we would like to have a growth and planning committee to start one in March. So we're going to have one March 9th at 6 to 7. I didn't share this with Dr. Versus yet because I'm waiting for the green light on the transportation department because we created a, a professional development in that building. So more than likely, I'd like to have it there. We're going to discuss it. So that gives people the, the idea. They get to go see what we spend our money on transportation. And it's right next to the auditorium. So I think it would be a good place, good location. Mm -hmm. It's a good uh, uh, open room to have a, a meeting. And so that's probably where we're going to have it. I just want to make sure it's ready because I didn't put it down there to be announced at this time because I don't want to say it's there and then all of a sudden they're not ready for it. Are there any guidelines for the person that each of us board member? No, not necessarily. I guess, it, it, I mean, you really have to, you guys ask about the guidelines on who they want to represent them. That just says the six people that yeah, uh, each person that the board member works with. I mean, you know, community member, teacher, uh, you know, somebody. We normally uh, prefer community members. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying if you, you can get anybody out there. But we never did put guidelines. It would be up to each individual uh, trustee. Send it to me or send it to you, Lloyd? The board recommendation. I would like to get them because I'm actually starting the invites. So we have the site now, uh, and then I'm going to start inviting people when I give them clean time to sign for it. So do you want phone number, email? It would be best if both because we're going to send an email to them and then we're going to give them a personal call too. So. Okay. And then when the meeting's coming up, it would be great if you would reach out you know, to the person you're appointing because this invite them too because I think they would appreciate that. Uh, Sometimes if they don't know that you're pointing them, and I call them, they don't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So it'd be good if you're going to point somebody to let them know that you're going to point them. Because I've run into that before. If I call them, they're like, what are you talking about? Well. Okay. So, uh, Sorry, that's my fault. Yeah, that's not the first one. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. So, well, I got one more question, Brandon, on yes, that. Sir. Um, if, say, the person that at the, for the PTAs, um, is there any way to have a backup for them? Yeah, we asked that, uh, we do that for the principals too. So the principal says they can't make it, we want them to send maybe an admin or somebody that can represent them. And we would ask the principal the same. Uh, if you have the, the PTA president on it, doesn't necessarily mean they have to be the person that uh, comes the next time. We would like for them so we can keep some continuity, mm -hmm. but if they can't, we want somebody, we want a representation from that community. So uh, we, we ask the principal to bring Somebody that's there to me. There's just a, a really big sounding board that have uh, proven in the past that looks wise. Um, some um, trajectories we may not have thought or looked at, then it goes back to growth and planning, subcommittee, and then to the, the board. But the board's only one to take action. Mm -hmm. Some doubt there. Okay. Uh, item 7 we'll come back to after the closed session. Uh, item 8, Texas COVID Learning Acceleration Supports T-Class by clinical so teachers. We're going to turn back T-Class 4, and now we're going to talk about T-Class 5. And so I do have Will Bates here. 
and he's going to talk now about clinical features. Okay, President Vasquez, board members, thank you again. I'm really excited about this. This is uh, another uh, part of the T class grant that's going to help us again. Uh, uh, answer some of our staffing needs uh, that we're going to have in the future. And so we've been given some money by, by the uh, TEA to help us create some innovative staffing and recruitment plans. And so we've developed a partnership with Texas A&M San Antonio. And uh, what they have is they've already placed three what we call full year teacher residents. So usually a, a student teaching assignment is, is for one semester. But these three have been here all year. And they've been working for us at CASTEM. And uh, what's great about this is this will allow us to pay them a stipend. So on days when they're not directly involved in their student teaching, they can do things which they already have, done things like tutor and even do some substitute teaching. And this will allow us to pay them, uh, pay them a $20,000 stipend. It will also uh, give us a chance, their mentor teachers who work with them all year as opposed to just semester, uh, they can also uh, get, receive a stipend of $5,000 through this grant. In return, they will do some extra work with the university, uh, uh, planning work with the university. Uh, they'll, they'll do a lot more uh, monitoring of the progress of those uh, three student teachers. And uh, so it's a, it's a win-win for both us and Texas A&M and San Antonio. Uh, and so uh, basically I've come to you to ask you if you would okay uh, us creating those those teacher resident positions and providing those five thousand dollars stipends to the mentor teachers. And that's what we're asking for you tonight. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Just, just so who's the grant money coming through? TEA. It's a it's part of the answer. Oh, part of the It's the answer funds that get. And they're creating these programs. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's the first part. It's the first part. And so they're putting through their windows. They want to see these opportunities with the idea that the folks, you know, we hope that there's yeah. better funding in the future, that we can do these things, and they're just trying to see different opportunities. They're really getting really creative in this zone uh, because there is a huge uh, expected teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in 15 years. And so you have to you grow your own program. Yeah, you have your clinical where you put a more ready level teacher in the classroom on day one when you do these things. And so there's a lot of emphasis around there. I know Francis and I uh, have been to a teacher shortage consortium meeting, region 20, and I believe we're getting invited to be on the state to one so that we can get a little more creative in Texas about how you get more teachers ready to be in a classroom and encourage more teachers to want to be in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And the sustainment for these uh, stipends, or just just one time deal, or it, it, this is a grant program, two year grant, and then once the funds are gone away, hopefully they look at it, see if it's impactful, and they give us more funds for it. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time for us, if it's just something we're not going to look at ourselves, we're going to want to get funded. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of I don't want to say a pilot for it because it's going to be implemented, but it's you know in the future we have to. It is one of the questions that was brought up to the superintendent first, and it'll be at state level. TEA was represented there. Um, also, a lot of legislative bodies were there. So these are things that they're hearing from districts. If you want us to um, be able to sustain, sustain it, you're going to need the funds to do it. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. I move. Second. A motion a second. Any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. Consider approval of reclassifying clinic clerks. So um, we did a study, a market study, on clinic clerks that we have here in the district. We had a hard time filling two of the ethical positions, and we had a hard time filling two of the clinical positions. So we did ask the board to consider doing that. And we did ask the board to consider doing that. And we did ask the board to consider doing that. And we did ask the board to consider doing that. And we did ask the board to consider doing that. And we did ask the board to consider doing that. And we did ask the board to consider doing that. We did a market research with other districts locally who have clinic assistants and other positions. We found that we were a little bit under on that. We also took a look at all the criteria that a clinic clerk has to have. Currently, we are at a uh, level two in our, in our status. And at a level two, the, the majority of the other people in that area need a GED or high school diploma. 
clinic clerks need four separate certifications on top of that. They need medical experience. They have to have a DITO, which is an unlicensed diabetic care mm -hmm. certificate and training. They need to have their CPR with AED. They have to have first aid, and they have to pass physician and hearing testing certification. So when looking at all the other criteria that is required, we ask that that be raised to a level four to be competitive in the market and also to um, showcase our appreciation for the certifications that they must hold while sometimes they hold down the credit by themselves. Mm -hmm. Hi, I second. Motion and a second that the board approve raising the pay grade for clinic hurts from two to four. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Business and finance. Consider approval of design services for the Sun Valley Elementary site renovation project. As y'all know, uh, Sun Valley's approximately going to be 15 years old at the end of the summer this year. Uh, it's built in 2006, so we have been having some major issues with soil movement. Uh, always have had soil movement issues at Sun Valley. It has become, we've, we've tried to band-aid a few things here and there to try and save some money. At this point, the, the soil around the building has rose so much that on heavy rains, we're getting water infiltration into the building, under the building, into the gyms, we're having sandbag things. So uh, the, the district has met with CEC, we got a proposal. CEC was the civil engineer on the job originally in 2006. And so we're requesting that we approve CEC as a civil engineering consultant that can do the design phase for a project that we plan to do this summer. The estimated cost of the project is around $500,000. The contract to CEC would be for eighty-two thousand seven fifty, and that would be they would. We would not have an architect on this job. We would just have a civil engineer to do strictly do site work. work. So uh, we're asking that this, that, I'm sorry, that the board approve CEC for design services Sun Valley Elementary in the amount of eighty-two thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. I move. Second. Questions. Do you have an idea of what we have to do there? Yes, ma'am. Pretty much the entire blacktop is going to have to come out in between the gym and the building. There's areas where it has sunk and water goes under the building, which causes us more problems underneath. That building was not built with a mud slab underneath, so right now it's literally, there's no concrete, it's just mud. So any uh, work that we have to do under there, we're trekking through 12 inches of mud underneath. It stays wet all the time. So we're, we're going to redo some of the area ways to try and get the air movement through there, but at the same time, stop the water from infiltrating underneath the building and keep it from there are areas where uh, downspouts are pouring out onto the splash blocks and the splash blocks have went they go back to the building right. so then the water gets into the weep holes and it, it migrates into the classrooms and it doesn't happen on normal rains but when we get three inches in 30 minutes we have problems so so what I, you said you're going to have to remove the blacktop. Do you mean build the blacktop back we're, up or we're, what? We're probably going to take the blacktop completely out about eight feet down. Okay. And then fill it up with select fill. And then we're also going to leave a step uh, lower and have to maybe build some ADA ramps. Okay. But we're going to try and, because we don't feel that the soil is ever going to stop shifting, no. we're going to try and alleviate as much as we possibly can, kind of like what we did at Legacy High School around the building. Okay. And it's take a, take a lot of bad soil out, put mm -hmm. in good compacted fill, and then redo the concrete, and even then drop it a little bit so we have a little bit more time if it does continue to rise. Okay. Just curious, have any idea how deep they go to study? Normally the borings are 25 to 30 feet. Mm -hmm. then okay. we, we actually, uh, we have the boring logs from that, so it, okay. but it's in those it's, areas like when, yeah. Yeah. When we did Legacy High School, we went 300 feet that time we were testing that geothermal well, and it never, it was clay the entire way. So it was 300 feet of clay the whole time. Okay. Any other questions? What is the, uh, how long is it going to take to get all this done? The, the plan is to go to bid at the end of April and have it back to the board, either at the April board meeting or the May board meeting, to have it approved with a contractor. And then the plan is to get it done during the summer. We would start the day after school's out <laughs> and then work probably literally all the way through the summer right up to the first day of school. So okay. I worked with 
uh, Dr. Escobedo and let her know that that site's going to be all open for summer school and things like that. So. And that only includes ours, not the ones that they have. Uh, don't we have in some schools some that are set up by the other program? Right. And there, there won't be anything hosted there this summer because of this. We're, we're going to be tearing up the building all the way around the building. There's not just the blacktop area. There's other places that we're going to have to tear up and re-channel to get the water to flow away from the building. Okay. Okay, we do have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Consider approval of district wide playground servicing and canopy renovation project. Yes, sir. Uh, back in December, we went out for bid to three companies that were on the, the buy board Park Place, TF Harper, and Playwell. Uh, we are going after shade canopies for every elementary that doesn't have one and then synthetic turf surfacing underneath the main play structure where we have the, the uh, pre-engineered wood fiber. And so we spend every time we get a load, which basically one load is about $2,500 to $3,000, and one load almost fills up one elementary. So this is going to be a lot of money up front, but it should keep us where we're not continually spending and wasting money on fiber that uh, washes out, deteriorates, gets taken by the taxpayers that say they're allowed to take it. We've had that happen before. <laughs> um, so we, we would like to start this project as soon as possible. Play, uh, Park Place Recreation was the low bid on the job. They have gone around and taken all the exact measurements and know exactly what needs to go back in. So they'll be putting in a concrete slab and then the synthetic turf under all the main play structures and then adding the canopies. I think we're adding uh, seven canopies throughout the district. We would like to start as soon as they're approved. They're, they're ready to start within a two week window. So there will be, uh, the plan is to start with Sun Valley and Southwest Elementary because they both have the canopies already. And we'd like to get them started on the synthetic turf because there's not as long of a lead time for that product. The other canopies are about a 12 week lead time. So once we turn them loose, It'll take around 12 weeks to get here. We can still continue to go by putting in uh, the, the toggle bolts that they need for the structures. So we won't have to stop, but we, would, we won't be able to do all this work during the summer. So we'd like to start now and start hitting them as we go. It will be about a three week process at every elementary that's getting out. Well, so the there will be time be where they don't have. Three weeks or what? I'm sorry. The school will be without for three yes, weeks? Yes, ma'am. They'll, they'll have to relocate from that main play structure. Most. Most every school has at least a play field area that they can go to in, in the, somewhere on their campus uh, where they can avoid being there. Uh, what about the color standard. combination for the canopies for the campuses? Uh, we were going to go stick with a district standard that Sun Valley and uh, Southwest, they both came just plain uh, powder coated white poles with a blue shaped top. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've, we've bid done. that across the board with everybody. And then the synthetic <coughs> turf will just be a, a solid green. The, the, we're recommending that the board approve Park Place Recreation. Uh, the entire project total, including canopies and surfacing, is one million nine hundred thirty-one thousand eight hundred and one dollars and forty cents. And this project will be funded by SR two and SR three funds. Thomas, what is the lifespan of the canopy? I, I believe that we have a five-year warranty on the, the shade cloth. But it, we've had that one at Southwest Elementary since 2013 when it got torn out by the windstorm and have not had any issues there. So there, the lifespan is at least 15 years. Give or take. What about the turf? The turf whatever. would be, they say, at 8 to 10 years on when we have to replace it. Granted, this turf, there will be some spots that have high wear areas that we may, they have a way of cutting out just a section and blending it back in where it's not really noticeable. Mm -hmm. It won't get the wear and tear like a football field. Is this field. that soft stuff or what? Mm -hmm. It's exactly what you would see at the complex field and at Legacy State. Oh, like it's turf. Yeah. So it doesn't have oh, it's like grass? A, it's the it still has all the, the attenuation for the falls, uh, even from the 12-foot slide we have. So, it, I mean, it's three inches of rubber with the pad underneath. So it, but it it's like grass or like flat? Yeah, it's like grass. It's oh, flat, it's like grass? It's the, it's the Doesn't the that synthetic. get really hot? <laughs> Most of them will have the shade canopy over Oh, right. Doesn't that have all that black stuff? 
Yeah, the like thing. when they're running and you've got that black stuff There's running. There's rubber uh, ballast in the bottom, sand rubber, and then some cork that they put in. So usually, I mean, there will be, there, when you, if you sit there and really pick at it, which I know the little one probably will. The little be, ones will, there, yeah. There, there is, it is there, but we go back and rake it and just try and keep it. I thought we were talking, I thought all this time we were talking about, uh, soft, like, what they have downtown. And well, we, we, did, we, we priced both. Yeah. And but what the other happened? One, we, we only had $2 million. And how much was the other one? I believe it was approximately, it was close to a half a million dollars more. So that. two two point five. Yes, ma'am. Does it last longer? Half a million. It would be the same. It would be the same thing. Because it'll still yeah. wear out the section. It's it's still going to wear out the the height. So if it gets fall from the top, they're not going to hurt themselves. It's. Uh, it's it would be the same the as what they're falling well, on. Mike, so, so why, why don't we do this? Why don't the next meeting we bring both samples. Mm -hmm. That yeah. the board were to approve it, and then we could. If y'all want to change that, and we can find yeah. it. Yeah, I think we need to. See I want I want to mention that the you know. When my son played baseball, they had those that turf, and they said it was hot, and that the heat comes off the ground. Um, no, and definitely, in, in a direct sun, there's definitely yeah. temperature difference. Yeah, and my grandbaby went and we take her downtown to go play there in the in the right, and it's that stuff's really nice, and it doesn't feel like hot. It's like just kind of a a medium temperature. It was a sunny day, and it was hot outside, but it wasn't. It wasn't hot. Yeah. We can bring it back. That's, that's what the basis have. Yeah, I'm thinking totally we nice. probably could find five hundred thousand dollars to do it. The diff Especially when this is air surplus. But those little, I mean, I know you say the little black things aren't a problem, but mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen them playing football and it, yes, you know, it gets all over the place. And the little they don't have to put their fiber down spot. in there, do they? They can eat it. Right there, yeah. there's, it has to have the ballast yeah. to make the grass stand yeah. up, yeah. otherwise it's too slick. So they're going to put it in their mouths. Yeah, those little, those the little ones. They're going to put it in their mouths. The little ones. They're out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's biodegradable. Yeah. We'll have to do is we'll have the table there. I moved the table. Yeah. We'll have to go out to the beach. It'll take a little longer. It'll probably be a little summer. Well, we're just approving. Oh, no. We're no, we're, we're, we're approving. Y'all have that ready already? No, we didn't do that for it. Once we priced it, it was okay. I'd rather get it right than then, regret the, the decision that we make. Park Place Recreation would have to go back out and rebid that service. And we need to know we did that a, exactly. We did do a, an overall, when we did all three, they priced both, so we would know about what we're talking overall, at the, the difference in price. So I, we can take that back. Can you bring us information on as to the ability of it, the that. heat yes, kind of situation, right? I'll get that from him. Mm -hmm. How much time do you need? And How much time do you need? Well, I mean... Is that what you're going to have to do? Probably, probably in December. We're just getting into February. So okay. Six weeks. We could bring them back and let them speak if, if we had questions for them. Yeah. I don't know if we want to find a place that has this and go visit and see what we think. Or what? That or has the turf? Huh? That has the turf? Yeah, that's, that's yes, using this product on their playgrounds. I, I've or never we seen that. Yeah, I'd, like, like, I'd like to see. Uh, I'd yeah. like to go visit somebody that has that turf. Yeah. I, mean, I already know what him. I've never seen that turf anywhere. I mean, I don't know who has it, but I haven't seen it. I've seen that other soft stuff. The base has it at all their big playgrounds. Mm -hmm. They have huge nice. playgrounds. Mm -hmm. Very nice playgrounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also questions about that stuff, because I see that in, in the base playground, there's areas that, that end up having, like, holes. So, I mean, the durability of that it, is also... It depends on what substrate they use underneath, if they mm -hmm. use concrete or crushed limestone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, so guys. So, we want to... How much time do you want? I, I would need at least two months. A week. <laughs> <laughs> a okay, as, as a... I could yeah. probably get it. By can, yeah, and as of now, let's look at doing that at the brown bag in yeah. April, and then I mean March, and then uh, bring it back to the next meeting in March. Yeah. And if you need we'll more time, if you need more time, you come. We'll, we'll just ask for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Is everyone in agreement? Okay. Okay. That is a friendly pull. I moved the table. Okay, do you want to move the table with a specific date? Next board. Or do you want to move the table indefinitely? No, next board meeting. Okay. And are you okay with the friendly amendment as spoken 
to bring it to the brown bag yes, with information? Yes, sir. Okay. There is a motion to table for the next meeting and a friendly amendment to uh, also bring information at the brown bag. I second. There is a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> Thank you. What about vote? I just was asking if is that an issue if we're not ready? No. Uh, not what ready. what will happen is is we'll look at it at the brown bag. Is if you're not ready at the next meeting, you just come back and tell us and we'll so postpone it again. Will we vote on the canopies already? Because that was all together. We know we're going to do Well, no, because okay, whoever we go back out to bed, they'll get to bed the canopies with the turf. It includes yeah. the canopies. Yeah. Okay. Thomas, go work. Okay, uh, if I'm not mistaken, CNI has nothing. Is that, and we can now go into our closed session. Lloyd, do you have one more thing? No, just appreciate everyone. Other work, the staff, 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 Okay. Pursuant to Government Code 551.074 and 551.072, we will now go into closed session. Call this meeting back to order at 7.30. And we'll go first to item 7. Mm -hmm. I move that. Second. We have a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendations on personnel. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. <clears throat> okay, uh, since Lloyd's not here, Brandon, Francis, Dahlia, do we have any more one item? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> somebody tomorrow. would. It's our first of uh, three half days. Uh, we also have no school Monday. It is a student holiday, but a staff work day. And on that day in the morning, we'll have to have a public breakfast for our staff before they go off to their own time for the moment. We'll have to be from 6 30 to 8 30 if you'd like to join us. Uh, we'll still be at Harper High School behind. Everybody will meet there and then have breakfast and then go on about their day. Uh, I know tomorrow there's a grassroots meeting at 3 20 at 6 p.m. with the board. And then, uh, lastly, we have our growth and planning committee on the night. And more than likely, it's going to be at the transportation department from 6 to 7 uh, in their new PD facility. I'm telling y'all now, but it could change if I go and talk to them and they, something happens where it's not ready. Mm -hmm. uh, technology is the best one. So, the, the meeting on March 9th, <laughs> we need to tell our people that we're Yes, please do so. If we're going to call them anyway, but just so they know that we're going to do it. Do we have it on the announcement? Yeah, we do. Okay. 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 Okay.